Okay, perfect. Um, so this is the final event of our two day conference that has been happening over the last two days that I'm sure lots of you have been part of many of the other talks. Um, but we're delighted to host uh, Sanam Naragi Andalini, who has a kind of a, a plethora of experience in the different themes that we've touched on and is the perfect speaker because she can offer this kind of holistic approach, touching on all of her different career experiences to offer insight into kind of the multiple themes that we've looked at. Um, so she has 24 years experience in conflict, crises and peace uh, and will offer an invaluable perspective, I'm sure. And as a very crude summary of her career, um, in 2000, she helped draft the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security. In 2011, she also was the first senior uh, expert on gender and inclusion on the UN's mediation standby team. And this is very much, without speaking too much for you, Sanam, because I know you're going to probably go into this, but fed into her um, evidencing of how women are crucial first responders in post-conflict zones and, uh, and should be integrated in, in a much better way in multilateral responses to, to violence and conflict. Um, and with that contextualize it kind of with that that experience really contextualizing her founding of the ICAN, the International Civil Society Action Network, which um, connects, supports, and funds uh, women peace build, peace builders around the world. Um, I would highly recommend going to their website. They have some amazing events. And more recently, she has been appointed the director of LSE's Center for Women, Peace and Security. So an incredible career that we will talk about much more um, and we have lots of questions. Um, just a bit of housekeeping, we would really encourage all of you to submit any questions that you have, no matter how irrelevant you think they might be. This is very much an informal chat. Um, and throughout this conference, we have really encourage people to uh, speak aloud their questions. We, we kind of, this is usually in person, so we want to encourage that as much as possible. So just pop a note on the Q&A and we can promote you to a panelist for a couple of minutes. Um, and without further ado, I think we'll begin. Thank you, Sana. Great to be here with you guys. I know it's an often Friday afternoon, so thank you for the hangers on and the survivors. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure after uh, it, well, it's been a long day, but um, I hope that we'll make this last session fun and interesting as well. So yes, let's go. We, we decided, to, for those who don't know, we decided we do it kind of really very much as a Q&A so that it's a it's conversation, not just me talking at you, because I'm sure you've had enough of that already. That's great. I mean, hopefully it will be exactly as you just described it. So I will actually start with the first question that for me, obviously, as a person from a Swiss background, um, I believe everyone watching can see that your name on Zoom actually reads MBE at the end. And since I know that my family is watching, and I'm sure they, just like me a few days ago, do not know what it means. Do you mind quickly explaining what that is? <laughs> that, that's <laughs> that an, thank you very much. That's a very sweet uh, thing. So it, it means member of the British Empire, which is, which is a strange title, um, but it's an honor that um, is given by the, I guess, British government, but, you know, it's, it, it's usually sort of by given by the queen in terms of, um, for, and I was given it for services to international peace building and women's rights in, uh, in 2000. So thank you. Although there is, a, there is a move right now to turn it from British empire to order of British excellence to be more relevant to, to the 21st century. So, um, so that, that, that's what it is. Thank you. Arguably, there would also be much less negative connotations that some people would perhaps take <laughs> if that yeah. word of the empire would be removed. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for our first question, um, uh, obviously there has been one hot topic during this entire year and perhaps without much surprise, our first question will be about the ongoing pandemic and COVID-19. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we would like to ask you, and we have raised this question in a specific way, you're obviously free to take it quite literally or also not, but if you're thinking and looking at the international response to the pandemic and all the related aspects, what are some of the things that really make you mad? What <laughs> makes you mad? What makes me mad? Um, what a great question. Um, 
So I'm going to start, I'm going to actually preface what I'm going to say by um, apologizing on behalf of the baby boomer generation and the generation X generation, which is my generation, to all of you, because, um, and my children are the same generation as you, um, they're in, in university right now, for the world that we are handing over to you and, and very much the international system that we are handing over to you. I, I, I feel as if um, these two generations have really not done service um, to us globally in terms of not only maintaining and strengthening and sustaining what was created back in the, you know, at the end of World War II for us as, a, as an international peace and security architecture with development and humanitarian aid and so forth, but, um, but really making it fit for purpose for the 21st century. And, and I say that because the COVID response is a direct indication of that lack of attention, the failure, the lots and lots of nice words. You know, the, it, it feels as if sometimes the more you see uh, people kind of expressing rhetorically really important statements about how important it is to do local stuff or how important women are or how important the development aid is, um, the more they say it, the less is going on on the ground. And, and what we're seeing with the, with the international kind of response to COVID is that, first of all, when COVID hit, you know, last year, this, you know, March last year, when, when all of us kind of um, suddenly uh, realized that, that this is serious, um, our, all of our governments were asleep at the wheel at the, at the earliest stages. And there was the level of, actually, I would say profound racism that drove political decisions. So, you know, if you were sitting in the UK at the end of January 2020 or early February 2020, as I was, and you were watching what was going on in China on Twitter, you knew that there was something serious. You know, it wasn't that the Chinese are just crazy and they're authoritarian and they like to lock people up in their houses and, and, and fumigate their, their streets at night. It must have been something something serious going on. And yet, the, and, or that people were wearing masks and, you know, uh, um, as we saw around the world, kind of people making fun of uh, um, Asian um, uh, community kind of wearing masks in, in, in public places. The attitude was, oh, these crazy Chinese, the Chinese are authoritarian. And these, you know, there was racism, implicit racism in, in the response to, to what was happening in China. Then it spreads and it comes to Italy. And again, the attitude, oh, the, the, the silly Italians, what do they know? They're so disorganized. You know, that's why it's happened. Then it went to Iran and it was, you know, images of mass graves and it was, oh, these Iranians, and I'm, I'm Iranian by background. So, oh, these Iranians are just so dictatorial and awful. Look, they're burying their people in mass graves, right? So, but instead of looking at it and saying, what is going on? How, how profound is this crisis? It was, this was the sort of lackadaisical response from the UK and, and, and certainly from, from the United States. And then this pandemic comes here and guess what we end up having? We end up having mass graves on, on island outside of New York. We end up having um, really mixed up responses and, 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 and so forth. So, um, so that exposure of um, sort of the silent or implicit racism that, that dictates so much of our attitudes around the world. That, that was something that I found disturbing. And, and, you know, on the one, I was kind of revealing it, but it was also very disturbing. The second thing that I saw was that um, all of our, you know, I, I, I live in, I'm, I'm in the States right now, but everybody became inward looking, right? We're worried about our own backyard and, you know, do we have PPEs in England and, and you know, and rightly so, right? You know, you have to look at your own domestic setting. But for me, working with um, this network, the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership, that that has members in over forty countries, all of them fragile contexts, right? It's like all of them were affected or affected by violent extremism across Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and so forth. What we saw was that as the world turned inwards, as, as rich countries turned inwards to look at their own concerns and, and everybody was stuck at home, literally, the attention and care about what was happening in Yemen or what was happening in Cameroon or what was happening in Colombia or Uganda or Nigeria disappeared. Literally people, you know, it just, it just disappeared. And, and, and again, the assumptions that were coming out of even organizations like the WHO were, were you know, you, it sort of made you scratch your head in terms of how connected are they to the real world and what, what we've done to the world um, over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, 
and my example for that is that the WHO was saying, you know, hygiene, hygiene, wash your, wash your hands with soap and water, right? I was talking to people in Yemen and in Cameroon and in so many places where in Somalia and elsewhere where they were saying, we don't have water. We don't have soap. We have IDPs and refugees. They can't afford soap. Right. And this wasn't just one place, it was everywhere that was that is poor, poor and fragile, right? Which, which again, going back to the original, you know, the, my original point about what, what is the world that we've created, it's been in the in the kind of if I, if I go go back to the 1980s and the beginning of a neoliberal economics and trickle-down economics and structural adjustment and and you know, you know, privatization and so forth, what we've seen for 40 years is that we have really gouged out and, and destroyed social economic welfare and, and, and systems and structures. You know, what, you know, clean water, clinics, healthcare, education, that kind of stuff, that kind of thing we, we've destroyed. And then you layer it with militarism and, and conflict. And, and not only we, we, we haven't sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of kept, maintained what was there, we've just literally destroyed these things. The water stations have been destroyed. And then comes this pandemic and the WHO is saying, hey, go, go wash your hands with soap and water. And there isn't, there literally isn't, right? So, so what did we see happen on the ground was that again, through this, this my network, um, as of pretty much the end of March, we started doing Zoom calls on a weekly basis with, with our partners. And, and it was anybody who wants to show up on a Thursday morning, um, you know, we would, the, the, they could come. And, and we started tracking and listening to what people were saying and then connecting each other. We're all on WhatsApp, but we ended up having a WhatsApp group of women from Pakistan and Cameroon and Nigeria and, you know, Yemen and so forth, teaching each other about how to make soap or how to make um, hand sanitizer. You know, you get the aloe plant, we get the alcohol, we do this. We, you know, it was really interesting, the innovation that was happening. The second thing that we saw, what that we did and we saw was that well, here we were internationally sitting and getting the latest information about should you wear masks or not, or how, how close should you be to someone and, and, and so forth. And what do you do if you're in a community setting from the you know, uh, CDC here in the US and, and, and from the WHO and so forth. And what we did was we would take this information, um, repackage it in more simple language, get it medically sort of okayed um, by, 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 by professionals, and then share this with our partners so that they then received it in English from us or for in Arabic, if we, were, we had the time to translate it. And they then were turning this information into pic pictographs because they were working with and in communities where there's a lot of illiteracy, right? So it's like, oh, you gotta, you gotta, you know, how do we, how do you do fist bumps and, and, and so forth. Um, we had to, um, we had our Pakistani partners uh, set up a system where the women that, up until then had been part of a community volunteer group that again, at, at ICANN we'd supported, who were doing prevention of violent extremism um, work in, in their communities and with, with young people. Those women automatically turned into um, sharing information about hygiene and how to deal with COVID. And they would do it in a very traditional way of standing on their rooftops in, 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 the, in areas and talking to each other across the rooftop. So this is something that's been going on for hundreds of years, a means of communication or hundred. And so they were doing this on their rooftops. And meanwhile, in real time, and you know, like we were sending through WhatsApp, okay, here's the latest information. And you know, here's what you need to do about masks and, 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 and so on. So, so that there was on the one hand, an unbelievable moment of suddenly seeing what it means for, for our work and, and the value of, that we've been kind of espousing which is that it's really important to strengthen local rootedness of act actors and, and activism and, and kind of social organ you know, organizations, civil society organizations, community-based organizations. You need that, that local rootedness, but you also need the global connectivity to be able to share horizontally across countries and then vertically between kind of them and, and what the institutions are saying and, and what, what the world was saying. And this is, this is really, um, if, if there's one, silver lining that I would say that, that we need to, to, to really um, get look into and say, how do we replicate this? How do we strengthen this mo modality, right? This is the one thing I would say the COVID era um, has shown us that uh, when, the, when crisis hits, 
it, it, the, law, the, the international actor is irrelevant, practically. The first responder is local. And actually, that's always been the case. Right. So if I if I take you back to the Beirut, the, the, the explosion in Beirut that happened, the first people on the ground to figure out who was alive and who wasn't and who needs trauma care were local local civil society organizations, often often local women. Um, Syria, Yemen, who's doing the humanitarian work, who's doing the, the, the mediation with armed groups and so forth. And even even if you take the image of a refugee camp. And, and a stereotypical image that you know, I'm sure many of you have seen in the media and so forth of a, of a woman carrying, you know, holding a baby, right? Often with mosquitoes flying, flies flying around. That's that image is shared with us often as, oh, look at these poor people and look at these poor victims. But if you if you switch your lens and you think about it in terms of that's a mother who has walked God knows how many miles. We don't know how many other kids she's looking after. We don't know how many other sick or elderly or, or disabled or whatever other people are in her care. And this woman has to make decisions on a minute by minute, day by day basis around how does she get access to food? Is there, is she going to walk and get wood or is, is there fire? You know, how else, how is she going to cook? Is there shelter? Is it safe? Can she go, you know, can her daughter go to the bathroom? Can she not? People are making decisions and they are the first responders and they know their context. And so, so what we as international actors have to be doing is being much more respectful of engaging them and asking them and understanding their agency and then responding and designing our responses on that basis and really becoming humble about who we are and what we are and what we know and what we don't. So, so that, that's kind of one, that question of local and then the role of the global. The other part of this that, that, that again was very frustrating was that, um, it was amazing that the international, and I, and I mean the UN systems and so forth, once you know, COVID comes, like any other response, like any other crisis, it's, it's a moment for capitalize, capitalizing on the, on the crisis because it becomes a moment of, of generating resources and saying, okay, who's gonna take the lead and who's gonna, you know, we need to do, you know, build back better, like, you know, all the sloganeering that goes on. For the 25 years I've been in this space, we've been saying every crisis, every issue has a gender dimension. So long as there are men and women, you know, forget about even trying to break down what we mean by gender and identities. And so, so long as we have people who are some, you know, some are men and some are women in the world, um, you need to have gendered responses in your humanitarian work. You got to figure out where are the women, where are the men, who's doing what, what, what are issues are they facing and so forth. And to suddenly be faced with yet another UN kind of machinery that was going forward without a recognition of you got to figure these questions out or put the questions in up front right at the beginning. And instead of, instead of having a women's task force or gender task force that's added, you know, three months later, um, that was another frustration that I saw. And, and I really, really hope that, that as you all go into this wor world of work and, and these sectors, um, this doesn't happen anymore. It should be just standard, normal things that we, we think about and say, who on the ground, who are the beneficiaries, who are the people we need to deal with, who, who are the actors? Let's figure this out and let's engage them on, on, a, on a respectful uh, basis on that way. So those were some of the issues that I saw. Sorry yeah. about the long answer. No, no, it's, it's fascinating. And absolutely, and you have to ask, you know, given that women have been the first responders for years and it kind of seems, seems an obvious point, why haven't the international community responded to that and, and adequately integrated those responses for years. I think actually that leads on nicely to a question that we had from, from Emma, who asked about your experience working on 1325 mm -hmm. and thinking kind of, you know, what's the future of that? Do we need a new resolution? And uh, yeah, ex you know, asking those questions about how we can better integrate those um, women-centric responses. Sure, thank you. So, so um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of the history of, of 1325 and then, and then tell you where we are and, and, and um, where I think we need to go with it. 1325 didn't come from the Security Council. Didn't, they didn't wake up one morning and say, ah, oh, women, we must. Absolutely not, right? It was basically in, in 1995 at the Beijing Conference for Women, the Fourth, Fourth World Conference um, on Women. It was a moment post-Cold War where we, we had a little window where we, which was called the, the peace dividend, right? We were looking at the world and saying, oh, we don't have the Cold War anymore. What's, what are the issues? Now, already in 1995, we had the Bosnian conflict that had exploded. 
at the, in the Bosnian conflict, they had rape camps. So rape was a direct tool and strategy of the conflict to destroy communities. So, so women were kind of, women's bodies were literally the, the battle uh, fields and, and the front lines of that. We had had the Rwandan genocide similarly, where women of uh, uh, childbearing age were di directly and deliberately targeted either to be killed or to be raped and forcibly impregnated to, to try and um, uh, destroy community. So there was this issue of understanding that we were in an, in an era where um, the nature of warfare was changing and it was no longer battlefields were no longer out in some you know, field somewhere and, and the home base was safe. Actually, the home was the battlefield and individuals and civilians were the targets. And, and, and that's, that, that trend has continued to today. And, and, I'll, and remind me to mention this if, if, uh, later on if, if I forget. At the same time uh, uh, that we saw this, that, that women were kind of at, at, the, at the, literally their, body, their bodies became the battlegrounds between men from, from different ethnic or religious communities and so forth. It was also in the immediate aftermath of the Oslo peace process or peace agreement for Israel-Palestine. It was a moment where, not, where um, Northern Irish women had gotten together, Catholic and Protestant, and they were making a really big push for in, in involvement in, in, the, in, in, the, in their talks, and they were doing a lot of the back channel things. So they came in 1995 to Beijing, and while there were other topics to be discussed, you know, women's health, women's education, the more traditional development stuff, they actually created a new topic area, which was called women in armed conflict. And, set, and, out, and out of those discussions between, say, this variety of people who were coming really raw from, from the wars of Bosnia and Rwanda and elsewhere, and then <clears throat> these, the, the, the ones that were actually sort of part participating in peace process, came chapter E of, of the Beijing Platform for Action that was basically saying, wars are changing, we need women need protection, we need, women need to participate. So this duality of, of, of issues. I was working at International Alert, which is a, a UK-based NGO, you know, starting in 1996, and we were looking at the changing nature of conflict. And we had colleagues who were working on the ground in places like Burundi, working with women um, around how do you bring, let's say, teachers and health workers, community workers, people who are trusted and who have access together as women to be the mediators and the peace builders. And, and for them to see that when you bring, let's say, Hutu and Tutsi women together in Burundi through conflict resolution exercises, for them to understand that they have more in common as women based on their experiences in life and, and what's going on than what divides them based on their ethnicity. Were so they keen coming for, you know, were they active? They were coming, yeah, they were coming in and, and, and we see this over and, I mean, this, this for me is a repeated exercise um, across the world that, that once you bring women together and you actually get them to say, okay, there's been a conflict and there's a war, how's it for you? How's it for you? Your kids, my, you're my kids, um, you're worried about this. Suddenly they realize that they have, that, that their gender identity is a much stronger unifying factor than the divisive essence of ethnicity, race, nationality, et cetera, right? But the point is that people wanna keep you divided, right? People. People today, they're, you know, Iranian, Israeli, Saudi women, right? Imagine if we could actually all get together and start talking about what's going on in the Middle East. Iranian, Israeli, Saudi, Palestinian, whatever. We'd probably have a lot of creative things to say to each other. And we could probably talk about the politics, but we could also talk about the social. And, and... But the laws of these countries, if an Iranian meets an Israeli, it's illegal. If an Israeli meets an Iranian, they get into trouble. So, so there's a divide, there are sort of ways in which conflicts divide us as human beings. And, and, and as women, what is it? So, so anyway, so Beijing does this. We, Alert was doing this work. And what we realized at some point was that there is no vocabulary for recognizing what women do. And, and in 1998, we had the first world conference uh, that was about women, war, and peace, basically, in London, actually with King's College as one of the, of the co-sponsors. I, I, I can dig up the reports from, from that meeting. We had 50 women from around the world. And it, again, the conversations were between those who were involved in peace processes, those who had been involved in being victims, those who had been fighters. We had a former uh, fighter from South Africa who'd been in the MK. She, she was called the, the knitting needle bomber, right? And she, she was now in, in the South Africa, at that point she, she'd been voted into the South African parliament after, after apartheid. 
And we started talking about these things and realizing that there, there's no vocabulary, there's no policy framework, there are no parameters. It's, it's just a completely invisible world. And that's when we started saying, okay, we need a campaign to go to the Security Council to, to have a policy framework to have a global reach. And the campaign was called Women Building Peace from the Village Council to the Negotiating Table. And it was consultations around the world in war zones to say, what do you want to say to the UN? What do you want to say to the European uh, Parliament? And what do you want to say to the uh, OSC? Those were the three policy targets that we had. My boss basically said, you're going to the Security Council. You know, So I get sort of sent to New York to, to work with organizations in New York and, and mobilize and, and, and so forth. And what we did was we drafted our version of the resolution that we wanted and we negotiated amongst ourselves so in the in the sort of working groups we had organizations that were working on refugee women we had amnesty that was doing human rights we had wilp that at the time was very heavily in the nuclear disarmament space we had international alert that did peace building we had to negotiate amongst ourselves what do you put in a draft resolution and and given that people have come up and said we care about participation we care about prevention of war we care about protection of women's physical and legal rights as refugees and in, and in war settings. And, and we care about sanctions, the impact of sanctions. So we negotiated, we drafted, we put our resolution down. We were lobbying governments day and night, both in New York um, Security Council members and in London and in Paris and, and whatever, giving them our resolution. And then finally, when, when you know, various pieces fell into place, Bangladesh, Namibia, et cetera, came on board. They took our resolution, they worked with what was then UNIFEM and had to then renegotiate because it had to become a governmental thing, right? So a bunch of the things that we cared about state, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the metrics and benchmarks and stuff disappeared, sadly. But a bunch of the stuff that came from women stayed. And, and that became, if you want, like the mother of sort of the flagship resolution. And it still remains important because the subsequent resolutions that we now have 10 women peace and security resolutions and then we have other ones that are about women and peacekeeping and, 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 and things so there's a plethora of resolutions. But the other ones that have come have come from governments and what governments often do is they limit it and say, you know, this resolution it relates to situations of, or of conflict or countries that are on the Security Council's agenda, it limits it all of a sudden 1325 doesn't have that. And that's really important because when Colombia was not on the council's agenda, Colombian women could use 1325. You know, so, so there are different ways that this has happened. Um, do we need a new resolution? No, we don't need a new resolution. And in fact, every time their new government comes on, they want to do a new resolution. They, they go for a women, peace and security one. They yay, yay, yay. It's been a bit of a disaster because we've had pushback from China and Russia. We had tremendous pushback from the US under Trump. Um, but more importantly is that these resolutions, the basics are not being implemented. And the more we think, oh, we need another norm or we need another action plan, people think that the, once you have the paper, you're done. No, the paper is a piece of paper, right? It's gotta be done on the ground. So, so for me, the issue is we know we have the language, we have good practice, we have good lessons of what works and what doesn't work. Um, what really needs to do is to have that system, systemic change and systematization of the good practices and getting rid of some of the inertia and the, and the old boys networks and others that, that perpetuate the bad stuff. We well, actually, I, oh, Livia, sorry, yeah. the problems of two of us, but we yeah. had a question in the gender panel that I think would feed into that. Um, and Helena asked about, um, how often you don't really, you know, it's, it's only really after a, a violent event or gendered violence that you then talk about what was the impact of that, the trauma. And by that point, obviously the trauma's already happened. So how can you better integrate preventative measures for sexual violence in particular? And how has the UN got the jurisdiction or the sovereignty? I think I find that kind of debate really interesting to actually intervene pre-conflict or even in a single country if the violence is within the country and it's not crossing borders. I think all of those issues really overlap and it's often quite a messy, there's no real straight answer. Uh, yeah, so, so definitely, so again, this is again where the local and the global becomes really important because this is, so in the aftermath of the Cold War, so going back to the early 90s, the, the issue that we saw with the international system was that it was designed to, you know, the, the whole UN system in terms of whether it's mediation, intervention, prevention, et cetera, is designed around interstate conflict, right? And, and 
that's one principle. Well, that's one element. The other premise. So on the one hand, we're saying we want to prevent. You know, the, the charter says we want to prevent the scourge of war for future generations. We believe in, you know, we the peoples of the United Nations, right? So there's it's kind of a sense of borderless. We're all in this together. Universal human rights and so forth. On the other hand, it says UN is member states. Uh, principles of non-interference and sovereignty of state are really important. So again, we come into the 1990s, we have problems in Somalia, we have problems in Bosnia, we have problems in Rwanda, et cetera. And uh, the, the, kind of the security council, they're all sitting there going, what do we do? What do we do? And, and, and they don't want to like put themselves at risk and so forth. So in the case of the Rwandan genocide, it took them three months to agree to call it a genocide because According to the charter, if it's a genocide, you have to intervene. But they were quibbling because they didn't want to send their own soldiers. Now, if you go back to the preventive side of this, what was happening in Rwanda um, in, in the, in the run-up to this, to this problem? Um, General Dallaire was heading up the peacekeeping mission in Rwanda. He was hearing the, the rhetoric. It was on the radio. There were talk, you know, uh, extremist Hutu uh, 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 radio was calling Tutsis cockroaches that need to be killed. I mean, it, it was literally a commission afterwards, a Danish commission afterwards. It was like all these early warning signs about who they were going to target, how they were going to do it. It was all there, right? Gendered, non-gendered, um, you know, women, men, etc. General Dallaire was sending these red alerts to the UN in New York, to the head of the peacekeeping uh, uh, department at the time, who was, uh, was a character called Mr. Kofi Annan. And, and Kofi Annan was ignoring what General Dallaire was doing, was saying, right? It just, it, they just weren't taking it seriously. And in fact, when things got worse, they pulled out, instead of adding more peacekeepers that could have actually just calmed things down, they pulled out the peacekeepers, leaving a, a very limited few people. They pulled out international staff. International organizations took out their own staff. They took out their pets. They didn't take out their Rwandese local colleagues. This is, this is, again, that kind of moment where you, where you say, wait a second, are we in this all together or are we not? Right? And, and, and subsequently, there, there, you know, there was investigations and so forth about, about the role of France in actually enabling and supporting the extremist movements. So it's not that, oh, this is just the locals having their own little spat and we don't have anything to do with it. No, we're all, we as in the international community, whether it's the, you know, the, the powerful countries with the weapons and post, you know, colonial uh, interests and so are always present. So, so this is the, this is unfortunately, this is the horrific game that, that's been played. They, because of these various events and it sort of started with Somalia and, and you know, coming up to Rwanda, there was a move to say, okay, wait a second, this is not working. So we need a new initiative from the UN system, which became the responsibility to protect, right? And the idea was that if a country, if a, if a government is not protecting or is basically attacking its own civilians, um, the international community needs to intervene and stop and intervene, including militarily, right? So responsibility to protect becomes this idea. Fast forward to um, Libya, 2011, 2012. I was working at the UN at the time, and you know, there's a revolution, and people are are uh, an uprising against the Gaddafi government, and and basically in Benghazi they're saying he's going to come and kill us, right? Security Council meets um, uh, at the time the the, the French presidency um, before my call. Uh, they basically say we need to take an, uh, we need to take action, and it becomes a NATO mission, right? And 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 I, I remember the night that the resolution was, was adopted, we were at a gathering and I said, you know, the, the whole, again, the premise of the UN is never again, never again, war, never again, genocide. And, and I remember when they signed this, I said, you know, I wonder whether this is ne never again will never, never happen again. Meaning that if this is a failure, if what they do in Libya doesn't work or there's a, we will never again step in to do anything. And, 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 by, and it becomes this kind of one-shot deal and it becomes this militarized situation. So with Libya, they went in with NATO. There was, from, from the mediation side, there was a whole question, okay, who do we talk to? Who, who will be the, the new government, right? Who, who are the new leaders and, and, and so forth? And, the, and to me, the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes that was made was that a bunch of Libyan exilees, all, all, many of them Muslim Brotherhood, and, and basically came up and said, hey, we are. We're the opposition. 
But there are lots of people in Libya. In fact, the Libyan revolution was started by women. There were lots of really great, courageous women, lawyers, democracy activists, human rights activists, et cetera, et cetera. And they were completely erased from the scene. They were completely erased from the discussions. I, I know because I was inside and I was fighting for it and I saw how, how it gets done. Um, and, and we anointed, we as in the international community, the United States and others, anointed the, the Libyan Transitional National Council or something and said, okay, these are the guys. And then we brought these guys and we brought them everywhere and we funded them and, and, and so forth. And, and by the way, what we also did was we had NATO doing the, the you know, fighting and it was a moment of, well, it technically wasn't meant to be a regime change um, resolution because the, the Russians would have never agreed to that. On the other hand, if NATO goes in and Gaddafi survives, what does that tell you about NATO? You know, one guy gets to beat the whole of NATO. So it was, a, it was a really contradictory thing that they set up and it was very much about egos and uh, you know, momentary decisions and so forth. But they get rid of Gaddafi, they, they put this guy, they, um, they didn't want to have a heavy kind of presence of Western soldiers or Western uh, you know, forces because of Iraq, uh, what happened in Iraq and so forth. So they outsourced the security space to the UAE and to Qatar and to these, and those guys basically pummeled and funded Salafi extremist, you know, those types of groups, militias to go in and Libya became a total mess. It is, and, it, and, it's, and it's insane what we have done to Libya. We're really responsible for this, right? But it's, it, that became the, the, so, then we come the worst, the, you know, if, if, if the, and I didn't mention the Iraq war, but, the, but if, if the Security Council decision to sort of not agree to the Iraq war and, and uh, back in 2003, and the UK and the US went against that decision, if that was one big whack in, in terms of the credibility of the international system, the next big whack comes in 2015 with the Yemen war, because Libya, even Syria, you could argue, okay, these were civil wars. Do we go in? Do we not? Should we? Should we not? you know, moment decisions being made at various moments, calculations and so forth, various mistakes. But the Yemen conflict, so Yemen has its revolution. Yemen has, again, lots of women, lots of young people. They set up a national dialogue process. The UN helps. It was women, youth, tribal leaders, political leaders. Everybody was part of this national dialogue process, right? The Saudis didn't like it. The, the, the Gulf countries didn't like it because all of a sudden the poor cousin, the Yemen, is practicing democracy in an area which has, you know, sheikhs and dictators and, and kings, right? And, and they didn't want this to work. And so, so on the one hand, they wanted to spoil whatever attempts was happening in Yemen. At the same time, the, the Iran JCPOA deal was being made and the Saudis, at which the, you know, was MBS, he was all of 29 years old, wanted, you know, wanted something as a prize or something in return. So the Obama administration okayed the bombing of Yemen by Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, and under the premise that, oh, there's this Hutu militia group that has taken over, the, the Yemeni government has fled to Saudi Arabia and the Yemeni government wants this to happen. This is one member state bombing another member state. This is the, the entire the Security Council's purpose in existence is to stop this kind of behavior. They greenlighted the Yemen conflict. Two days later, Saudi Arabia was bombing, which means that they were preparing for it way before. You don't get to suddenly start bombing. It was meant to last two weeks. It's ongoing, right? So it is, it's, it's literally as if the five, and then, and then you take the five members of the permanent members of the Security Council, UK, US, France, all of them have made billions of dollars in selling weapons to the Saudis for, for, for the Yemen war. Uh, Russia and China, meanwhile, are doing whatever they want because nobody's paying attention. China's basically bought up the, the world and, and is, and, and the Russians have reemerged. And, and as I say, going back to the beginning of the conversation, I'm really, really sorry, but we are now, my generation is handing over to you guys a new cold war, which is US, Russia, China, and an era of, a mix of, on, on the one, on one hand, um, populist authoritarianism, 
right? Trump and Modi and, and these guys, but they're gouging out our democratic systems. And then authoritarian populism, which is that it's okay, we're all, you know, in social media, everybody has a say in everything, but actually we're not really learning to talk to each other. So we're becoming atomized and kind of little tribal conversations um, in, in, you know, it, it's, it's and, and we're totally intolerant of each other, in, but in the era of extreme pluralism. Geographically, in our cities, we're all living together. Our families are more and more mixed up and so forth. Our idea, you know, so instead of taking this pluralism and saying, what are the best parts of it and how do we deal and how do we cope and, and how do we, as I say, take the global and the local, strengthen the lo local where it needs to be and think about what is the role of the global, right? Not, not to be neo-colonial, but to actually be helpful. Um, we're kind of handing a big mess to you guys, which, and, and the COVID world has, has kind of turbocharged this, this kind of devolution and, and the messiness that, that we're dealing with. So that's why I'm, I wanted to apologize. It's, it's, not a, it's not a very happy picture that, uh, at, on an international level. The, the hope that I see is the local work that's going on. And the hope that I see is, a, is actually a younger generation that's coming in and is skeptical or under, understands the importance of connectivity and so forth, but actually also sees that these systems and institutions are really not doing what they need to do. And so we really do need to renovate, if you want, the, the infrastructure and the architecture to be fit for purpose for the 21st century. Again, long answer to some questions. I think you managed to articulate some things that many people feel around themselves pretty well. So I think that was a pretty good response. And I hope, I do hope we can get to, I believe she called uh, Julia's question later on. Um, I was just wondering, because in the beginning of our talk, you, you, you mentioned the, the word boomer, the baby boomer generation, and to, to get some background. So I myself, before I came here to London to study, used to be very active in the Swiss climate movement. And what I and everyone else there saw happening with COVID while we were, I think, having some success in pushing some sort of radical climate justice discourse during COVID, the attention completely dissipated. And what I think has a little bit, since you also touched on the role of, of women in conflict and what we in the climate movement have been talking about, and you also mentioned this a little bit, is um, intergenerational justice. And mm -hmm. this is also very connected to the issue of youth or young people as um, sort of a category or an identity category, which also suffers from inequalities and some sort of less maybe suffering from oppression and domination and more of a lack of space to actually autonomously really make any sort of decisions or move forward. I'm wondering what what has what have been some of your experiences, especially with the with the ICA and, and in terms of youth, and especially obviously in uh, in conflict settings of uh, various kinds. That thank would be you. very interesting. Yeah. No. Thank you. And and so so a couple of things. Um, I find it fascinating because. Uh, there's a there's a kind of a nexus of gender, age, race that are, are the various barriers that that, that exist. Um, and I'll be I'll be honest with you. I'm 53, and and I look at it. And I'm like, you know, really, at this point, I should be able to, you know, if if we as women have been saying, and and you know, going back to the 1325 argument, you know, we've been saying we need more women mediators. We need more women senior positions in dealing with conflict and security issues based on the perspectives that we bring, the experience that we bring. And because this agenda has largely come from outside the, in the sort of formal systems, a lot of the experience, my experience sits in civil society, I've worked with the UN or I have colleagues who've worked with the UN, but so many of us sit outside the system. And yet, even we are still fighting to, to say, can we open those doors? So, so I, I just, this, just this morning I saw, there was a tweet of a, of a, of a photograph of a meeting between the UN envoy for Yemen, and he's gone to the region, he's talking to the Iranians and others, and it was a, it was a room full of men, old, white-haired men. And I'm like, 
it is gerontocracy is is kind of stifling all of us, right? It's it's there is a you know how, we can we can talk about how nice or not you know our various leaders are, but there is a real problem when that the, 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 the inability to open up space, right? The inability to bring the next variations of the next generation forward, right? And, and, and to sort of keep, keep that space open and, and mentor and, and, and so forth. Now with women what, and with ICANN, what, what I've tried to do, I mean, apart from my, my own team and my own staff being various ages and, and young people, and you know, we, have, we have everybody, I, I'm, I'm definitely the oldest um, in the mix. Um, in the network, we have a variety of more experienced people, people who've been at it for 20, 30 years, younger women that have come in, um, organizations that have been either set up by younger women or organizations that are set up by, by older women and, and they're bringing in younger women. So we see a, that diversity of age and experience coming in. And, and the, the, one of the challenges that, that I see is that it's really important to be able to, on the one hand, value the experience that comes by having been around the block a few times, right? It's, it's for example, when I, you know, any, any 13, any conversation I'm in these days around women at the table, you know, Afghan women should be at the, at the peace table, Yemen women, Yemen, like literally I have, this is a repeat for me, it's like pushing repeat, going back five, 10, 15, unfortunately 20 years, right? So what I wanna make sure is that if the next, generation is coming through, they don't start with thinking this is new, that this problem or this, you know, the way that it's been framed is, new. no, it's not new. This is the same old way that they, you know, they'll tell you, go and get evidence. They'll tell you it's culture. They'll tell you it's, it's the same excuses repeatedly. And that, and so that's why I've written about it. And I've said, here, here's what they'll tell you. And here's what you got to say about, you know, or here's a way of thinking to, ch to challenge that. What we need is to be able to transfer that experience and knowledge effectively to the next generation, right? So that, so that it's not like, oh, I've just discovered, right? I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very nice when people think they've just discovered something, but a lot of the stuff isn't new, new right? So, so one is how do we transfer the knowledge? How do you transfer the experience? How do, we, um, how do we shift the practices so that um, the next generation isn't falling into the same cracks and holes? And, and, and by that, I mean, you know, when you come into the workplace, doesn't matter what, what sector you go in, in your 20s, you're raring to go and, and, and it's great, and you can do so much. If you, in your 30s, if you are keen on having children as women or as men, but certainly as women, it affects your work. It affected my work. I had to rethink the way, the speed at which I could do stuff and, and what I was doing, but, but I figured it out in, in various ways. And, and those experiences you also wanna share. You, you want to bring in, you know, a lot of times it's policy changes that you want to have in place to enable people to continue um, uh, working, you know, remotely or, or however it is with you know, childcare. So there, there, where there, there's sort of elements of how do we shift the the institutions so that it makes it easier. There's also another way of thinking about this, and, and this this I think is kind of where it's where it can get really interesting. Um, if I if I if we kind of go very simplistically in terms of generational things and say, okay, um, and especially this is for women, but we say, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the former um, Supreme Court uh, justice, she had to fight to get into university because it was all men, right? She had Hillary Clinton got into university to, to study law. So Bader Ginsburg had already opened the space. The Hillary Clinton generation goes in, they're already there. Um, as I looked at, and I'm, I'm the next generation down from them, as I looked at it, I was like, oh my God, these women are behaving just like the men. I want to go in and radically change from within. So I'm like, okay, let me, how do I, how do I do that? How do we get a security council resolution to change the way we talk about, you know, peace and peace and security and, and change the lens and, and so forth. So it's kind of within the institutional structures. What I see coming down the pipeline with the next generation is that by virtue of having social media and connectivity in all sorts of other ways and, and forces of influence outside the system, actually it's really important to think how do you change it from outside? So whether, whether it's Greta with the climate change or whether it's the, uh, the Florida high school um, uh, seniors here vis-a-vis -vis gun control, it's really thinking about what your power is, right? And, and, and the example for the, for, the, for the gun control question here, 
for me was was fascinating because these these kids mobilized and they realized that okay we can try and change the laws but that but it's so corrupt the co corporations have so much control over over legislation and over over lawmakers that they said we have more power as as consumers rather than as citizens and they went to the you know walmarts and the whatever you know sporting goods stores and and said we're not going to come and shop from you if you keep selling bullets and guns right and those guys looked at it and said this is our this is our next generation of of consumers of, of our of our clients right customers so they responded this kind of thing i think is really important for, for the younger generation to think about where does your power sit and 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 um and but but at the same time it's like don't forget to pick up on the knowledge and and stand on our shoulders right you don't need to come and stand in the hole that i had to stand in or the or the sort of platform it's i stood on one platform of, of the generation before me i've created a go but you need to have that knowledge base and and that requires being diligent about reading up and 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 showing up and talking the other part of the intergenerational injustice part that that i see and i and i'm, I'm glad that you reminded me of this is that in the same way that I mentioned, you know, we were seeing in the 1990s a targeting of women and that continues violence against women and, and really kind of using women's bodies or co-opting women um, for the service of, of a very sort of, like, sort of masculine supremacist movement. So whether it's ISIS or the white supremacists, they're really good at co-opting women and using women. They don't elevate women to the status of leadership. They want them there to help. They want them there to have kids. They want them there to be spies and messengers and fundraisers and so forth. But it's a masculine, it's a very sort of white or not a white male, but it's a male supremacy movement, as I say, any of these extremist identity-based movements that you see. Um, so there's a usage and use and abuse of women. The other side of, uh, uh, the other sort of th thread that's now emerging is the targeting of children. And this to me is, is one of the most devastating things that we're seeing. So if you look at Afghanistan, if you look at Yemen, if you look at Palestine, you know, the median age in Afghanistan is 18. 42% of the population is below the age of 14, right? So if we have empowered and legitimized the Taliban, which we have done, by the way, right? Um, and, we're, and, and, and we've set up a peace, peace process, a power, dynamic process, it's a power sharing uh, conversation where Afghanistan is represented 50% by Taliban and 50% by government, ex-warlords, political leaders, da, 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 da. You are letting the past literally kill the future. Similarly, Yemen, if we are arming and selling weapons to Saudi Arabia to go and bomb Yemen, and the majority of the population is in Yemen is below the age of 18, we are willfully killing children. I don't know whether you've seen that the images coming out of the Israel-Palestine conflict in, in the most recent, they are arresting kids under the age of 10. Israelis are, are targeting and arresting boys and girls, little kids, right? That's, that's what's happening. Why are they doing it? Well, you know, some crazy guy will say, oh, because they, these, these are the next terrorists. You know, it's, it's like, but there is, a, there is an insidious question here of, what are we doing when not only we're not leaving a client, you know, an environment that that's livable in or an economic system that is that that is kind of balanced equally, but we're now literally our governments, our military strategies, the or or quote unquote our allies um, are targeting willfully or by a mission or by commission children, and and we don't even have a name for it. We have a name for killing women. It's femicide. We have a name for killing based on ethnic or it's genocide. What's the name for killing children en masse? Infanticide is, is one word, but, but there, we, we almost need a new vocabulary for this. No, I mean, that is, that is very true. And I mean, the, I think the trend of children or young people, especially under 18 or teenagers being targeted in, in this way, either strategically or of repression, is a trend that we've been seeing a lot. Again, relating to Switzerland, it's just the context I know the most. We are about to pass a law which would allow the police without any sort of court order to put um, teenagers in, in under house arrest on mere suspicion. And yeah. I mean, this is unfortunately not, yeah. Yeah, 
you know, there's something really insidious going on. And, and this, this kind of, this issue of under the veneer of a democratically elected leadership or whatever, actually gouging out the, you know, our judiciaries, our independence, you know, the, the, the human rights norms and, and, and so forth. This is something that, that again, we need, we really need a push from the younger, from a generation coming through, from lawyers, from people to, to, to really understand this because it's, if you go back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, if we had implemented those 31 sort of, you know, uh, articles, the world would not be in the mess that it is right now. We didn't, it's been now over 70 years, right? Going back to women, peace and Syria, if we had just implemented what W, what the first resolution says, we wouldn't be in the place that we are now, right? So it's, we have all the words, we have all the right things to say, but it comes down to the implementation and, and the question of, you know, what, where does, where does power sit? Is it that we now have to work with corporations who are, as I said, this consumer question, do we use our power as consumers to, to do, to do that? It's the other thing that I, that I really want to um, highlight for people here is that very often, one of the things that they'll do in terms of sort of sending you off on a wild goose chase is to say, ah, we need capacity. You know, if, you know, if they were qualified, young people were qualified, women were qualified enough, et cetera. What we're seeing more and more, and it's, it's very obvious for me, is that it's not that women don't have the capacity or the experience or the, or the you know, qualifications, whatever that is. In fact, a lot of the men who get these positions don't have that at all. But what they have is connectivity and access. So, so and, and that's, that's where the networking and the kind of coming together and being able to sort of um, as I say, from the local to the global opening spaces up um, and, and so forth makes, makes a huge difference. If you take somewhere like Myanmar right now, you know, we, we talk, we have partners, me and Marie's partners, part of our thing is what do you want us to say and do? What can we do for you that you can't do for yourself? And what can you do over? So, so the, again, the connectivity, this space of extreme connectivity is really important and we have to kind of exploit that in a, in a really positive way. Yeah. I think um, just going back to your point about children, though, and, and actually Julia has brought this up in, in the chat box, and I think it's really relevant. One of the major issues to do with that is about the transfer of knowledge, selective transfer of knowledge and, and selective transfer of fake knowledge, as, as, as overused as fake news is. How do you think that plays into kind of or how do you think that affects response to violence or maybe preventative measure, methods? And yeah, let's go with that. I think we'll have to, this is the last couple of questions, by the way, because we'll be approaching here. Sure, I mean, you know, so, so th this is, um, uh, again, it's a really good and it's a really complicated question, right? Because part of the reason why the good practices that do exist or the knowledge that, that we do have doesn't get disseminated widely enough is that it's siloed, right? So we're all like in our little, and, and for me, one of the things, for example, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm keen to talk to students and, and, and in various places is to say, you know, you, if you're studying international relations or if you're studying development studies or if you're studying security studies, if you're not getting an insight into what the women, peace and security agenda is, if you're not getting an insight into what it means to think about these things from a gendered lens or from a localized lens, or, you're missing something. And, and it's really important to get that at, the, at a time when it's a formative period of where your mind is open and you're learning. And that knowledge like is so, ex it's hard to, it's so exclusive. I mean, I'm doing a master's at, at KCL, you know, and it's that, that, that awareness, I think is, yeah. it's hard to come by. And, and it's, and I, and part of the reason why that, ha that is, is because within acad academia, you get silos and silos next, you know, and then people become really focused on what they know and very often teaching is not their biggest priority, right? So it's not as if they're necessarily going out and saying, oh, I've got to, you know, I'm going to change the curriculum. I, I came up with a curriculum or, or, you know, module, you know, three years ago, I'm just going to keep repeating the same. It's like, they're not necessarily going out and thinking, okay, what, what new has happened, right? So your own professors may not know what they don't know, right? That's one side. The other side is that as practitioners, and, and, and again, for me, this is why I wear these, try and wear these multiple hats as, as crazy as, as it may, may look, is that it's really important as a practitioner to be able to say, okay, I've done all this stuff. How do I bring it in, into an academic setting? And how do I get students to actually see and learn and, and be able to, to think this through? But we're still stuck that there's gender studies and there's security studies. It's not, a, a, it, it should be that, okay, you come in and anybody who, who is graduating from, from King's or from LSE or from a, doing any of these 
social, social sciences, they need to have a gendered lens on everything because everything has a gendered lens, right? And, and me, if I, if I put my employer hat on the other side, I'm like, this is what I'm looking for, right? It shouldn't be that you come to me and it's the first time as, as, a, as a, you know, in your job application that, that you don't know this stuff, right? So there is an element of changing the institutions up and, and students demanding it. There's another element of saying, okay, well, where else can we find this? It's on, it's on, on the internet, it's on YouTube. It's these kinds of extra um, sort of curricular sessions and so forth. But, but if, if it's not embedded in the teaching, it's really hard to make it embedded in how you think. And, and I sometimes wonder, you know, how do the medics do it? Medicine keeps evolving. The teaching of medicine keeps evolving. Um, not only it's, it's evolving in the medical school, but you come out and you, you've, you've trained as a surgeon or a dentist or whatever, you keep having to go back and pick up the new tools, you know, latest whatever in endodontics and, and you know, whatever surgery. It's hard. It's, it's hard for people to keep, but they keep doing it. And yet in social sciences, we don't. And, 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 and I'm coming back to the peace process question. I'm like, you know, we have ample evidence to show that peace processes that are designed around two parties, two conflict parties, belligerent parties sitting and talking to each other, give you bad results, end up failing, end up fragment creating fragmentation and so forth. Peace results that are inclusive, especially of women, women peace builders in civil society have a better chance of, of survival. And yet each, you know, Afghanistan, we've screwed up royally. It, it's, it's devastating. Yemen is the next one coming along. And, and already with Yemen, we're seeing that even the good practice that existed for the Yemen process in 2015 is already being sidetracked and, and, and done in a multi-track process, which basically means, you know, here's the formal and then good luck to you down in the boondocks on, on track 15 where we have women. It's, it, it's this kind of inertia and it, and it relates back to people being stuck in their ways of doing things generationally, how do they see the world um, and, and the inability and unwillingness to try new, um, try new things for, for, for whatever reason, because there are no incentives or they feel as if there are no incentives for, for new practice. And there's certainly no obligations, right? They don't, they don't fail. Um, in fact, they fail upwards often when, when, they, when they get it wrong. Yeah, no, I, I think that is that those are some very important points. I mean, in our in I'm doing the CSD masters at King's and we have one class that is like one week is uh, about the gender and then it is more it is mentioned um, among the other topics that we cover every time in a short um, or whenever then it's relevant, it comes up again. And one of the one of the other topics that we mentioned leading up to any question. <laughs> is um, the international system as we know it. Because you have talked a lot about how we have all the words, we have the nice documents, and almost all of the right uh, dictionary and words that we want to use, but the implementation is not working out. And also piggybacking on one question that we have in the Q&A box. Um, obviously, a big topic in international relations is reform of the international systems. So mm -hmm. should more countries have a veto right? Should the veto right be abolished, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, maybe from your perspective, what do you think should be a few of the things which have to be changed or ideally should be changed in the international system to improve its working and maybe finally get closer to the implementation of these nice texts that we have to finally get that working? What are your... Um, for the first thing I would say is I would like uh, the powerful countries to lead by example, right? Um, and that's a that's a big it's a big problem, right? Because if you're the United States and you're saying um, ah human rights matters a lot, but your ally is Saudi Arabia, oh women's women's rights really matter. We think women are really, really important. And your ally is Saudi Arabia in terms of how it treats its women and how it has spread Wahhabism, which is one of the most um, extreme kind of uh, intolerant um, kind of sectarian uh, faiths, if you want, or belief systems, the ideologies. Um, you have a problem. If, if you're, similarly, I mean, I didn't even mention, you know, we mentioned Israel, 
right? So, so the hypocrisy question is a, is a big deal there. And, and, the, and the issue is that instead of it being that, okay, we're saying, here's the standard that we want, and, and we're all aspiring that way, it's become what about, so it's like, it's like well, you know, the, the Americans point a finger to the Iranians about whatever, and the Iranians are like, well, what about you guys? Or, and it's really kind of a spiraling downwards. You know, it's not about kind of being the one who says, hey, I got this and I'm, I'm great. It's really about, you know, what? I got a C minus, he got a D. Oh, he got a D, I got a D. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to the lowest common denominator as opposed to the highest common denominator. So this, this is one. Now, basic things that, that I, you know, we, I, I, and I'm happy to share with you um, some fun, like basic things of saying, okay, we don't need to knock everything down right now. Can we just do some of the little tweaks like at a moment, at this moment? Afghan peace talks. Why are we not making sure that a delegation of Afghan women peace builders, a delegation of victims of violence, a delegation of youth are being invited to Doha to speak to the various parties, to sit around the table and meet? Why are, why? Here's a question for you. Why are these big men and their guns so afraid of women? They, you know, the Yemeni parties won't agree on anything, the Afghan parties won't agree on it. They all agree on excluding women. So you gotta ask, what are they afraid of, right? And then why does the international community that is funding, enabling, legitimizing, et cetera, all these things on the one hand say, oh yes, 1325 and we have our national action plans. And on the other hand, sit there and say, oh, well, you know, the Taliban won't talk to women. No, the Taliban do talk to the women, number one. They talk to women all the time on the ground and, and, and so forth. I've talked to Taliban at conferences. So that's, that's nonsense. Secondly, who cares? If they don't, what you should, what the UN should have done is instead of uh, appointing Jean Arnaud, who's a very, you know, competent, very good guy, I'm sure, but instead of uh, appointing a white Frenchman to be the representative of the Secretary General, they should have appointed a Pashto or Dari speaking Muslim woman to be the representative of the United Nations. Why not? Is it is is the is the Taliban going to say, oh no, we're not going to meet with the UN, or are they going to say, of course we're going to meet with the UN? Right, so it's these. These are both symbolic and important gestures to make. Um, every time there's a peace conference, every single country in the world wants to come and make some declaration of, you know, we believe in. You know, I think Mexico was present when the when the Syria peace conference opened. Right, regional blah blah. blah. All these countries that that say they they support women or youth, peace and security. How about having in your own delegations a Syrian? peace builder, woman peace builder, and a Syrian young person. How about saying our three minute slot that, that we make a speech, we're gonna read from their statement or we're gonna, this person's gonna be in our delegation and they're gonna read the statement. Open the spaces that you have. I get, um, I, and this, 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 is, these are, this is a sort of classic and, and, a, and a really silly example, but recently I had a, a there's, there's a big conference coming up and um, I got an email from a, from a very nice colleague saying, I'm speaking at this panel. I haven't been on this issue. I haven't been looking at this issue for a while. Um, can you give me some talking points about really what's going on, right? Now, I'm like, I looked at it and my, you can imagine what my inner voice was saying, but really the answer should, the answer, what I should have said is, you know what, if I get invited to speak on a panel on an issue that I'm not really adept at or I haven't been involved in, I say, it's not for me to do this. Can we open it up and give it to somebody else? Why not so-and-so? I mean, it goes back to this point about occupying spaces and not giving, you know, why is it that there is a persistent thing of thinking they as individuals, they as a generation, they as a cohort of, you know, a, you know network of old guys, whatever it is. And, and by the way, a network of, 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 of women, you know, the old girls are just as, can be just as, um, Kabali in terms of how they keep things uh, uh, tied together. So it, it's, it's really that moment of saying, am I willing to kind of think about um, uh, changing the way, I, the, the way I do business in, as of today, you know? And, and, and it happens. So I've been at various points, for example, the Canadians or the Norwegians or whatever, there have been governmental conferences and they've put me on their delegation to be the speaker. For, so I'm like, it's done. The EU um, at one point, brought Yemeni and uh, when Federica Mogherini was, was, was the head of the external action service, um, she brought Yemeni and Syrian women peace builders on EU diplomatic visas 
to the United States, to the UN meetings, because Trump had banned Yemenis and Syrians from, from visas to the US. So she said, okay, they're gonna get diplomatic passports. They're, they, they're coming in. It's doable. It's been done, right? It's just a question of whether we really wanna shift these power dynamics and be transformative or whether we still wanna be like, I'm in control and you know, you, you're beholden to me in one way or another. That's the shift that needs to happen. And that shift needs to happen in the international NGO space. It needs to happen bilaterally. It needs to happen with, with, with the UN system as well. Yeah, I mean- and sorry, yeah. one, one, last, one last point on, on, on this question of what else you do. Um, Security Council in 2019 passed a resolution again on, in the Women, Peace and Security thing that we'd worked on where they explicitly say, they call on member states to protect and not harass civil society activists, peace builders, political actors, et cetera, uh, on the ground. Um, we have a situation where we have a country now that's on the UN Security Council. Um, they have arrested one of my colleagues, one of, one of our members um, who's now in jail. And one of the things that they said is that he participated in a meeting with the Security Council, right? It, that was a, so if you're gonna be on the Security Council, you should be abiding by the, its own resolutions. If you're gonna be, if you're gonna be Iran or Saudi Arabia or whatever country, on the board of UN Women or the Commission on the Status of Women, which is about women's rights, you need to adhere to this, the, the provisions of the Convention on the Dis uh, Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. That should be the criteria. And, and, and that's, that's the kind of thing where it's like member states, they vote each other in, and uh, member states should be saying the criteria for being on the CEDAW committee or the, whatever that is, is that you're, you're, you've ratified this, this resolution. You can't. You can't be on, you know, it's, it's the it's the fox in the in the chicken coop type of thing. But you can't have the fox in the chicken. I mean, you can be you know, roaming outside, but you don't put them inside and then say, oh, what happened to all the chicken? You know, so so yeah, so it's this kind of this kind of dual standards and hypocrisies. What's the point of having it on paper if none of you, even those sitting in charge of monitoring it, are not um, abiding and implementing and 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 so forth? No, definitely. I think. And now another overused term, but it seemed to me at the core of it is really political will and who to make those decisions and, and who, how can we put the right people in power and is democracy fit for this? You know, all of these big questions, which we could talk for hours about. Yeah, but it's, it's all of that. It's also, it's also never, under, never ever underestimate um, the degree to which personal competition and incompetence become the factors around which yeah. policies are made. And, and that's, that's the most depressing part of it, because if I believe that, you know, there's a conspiracy theory and, and there's somebody sitting, you know, with a big button and, and, and this is why things happen and there's some control, it would make my life slightly easier. It's actually seeing that, oh my God, this, you know, they make the soup in this way. And then, and then you know, here we are working on this issue for 20 years and the diplomats change every two years. So every two years you're dealing with somebody new who hadn't heard about this stuff in the last 20 years. It does, it's not like medicine or science where things build. So, so yeah, so, so and then as I say, personal, um, personal and vendettas, personal uh, competition between people within institutions and stuff can kill a lot of really good ideas. So. Yeah. I'm gonna put you on the spot and say, as a last concluding comment, what would be your one key takeaway from this talk and uh, you know, what would be your one, the single most important thing you'd like us to take away today? Single most important thing is, um, we are, and you are going to be living in an increasingly interdependent, pluralistic mm -hmm. um, world. We need these institutions that were created and, and um, with all of their flaws, we, we need a kind of a new energy coming in to make them work. So engage with them, challenge them, go inside them, change them from within, change them from without, mm -hmm. but don't take them for granted. And, and, I, and for anybody who's interested back in, uh, I have a book um, that I co-authored co called Civil War, Civil Peace from the 1990s. There's a chapter in it, which is a history of diplomacy. And for me, what's I, when I always think about this, I say, 500 years ago, two Italian guys were saying, we need to have a con you know, com coming together of nations. And then that idea didn't flow for 500 years. And then X million people get killed. And we come, we come five, five centuries to 
the, the League of Nations and that doesn't work. And then finally we get the UN. And it's taken a lot of time to get to where we are. And it's not inevitable. It was not inevitable. It does not last on mm -hmm. its own. It needs to be nurtured. It needs, and if, if people who care give up or withdraw, those who don't care and those who are in it only for personal gain will destroy these and, and, and they will willfully destroy these institutions and the norms. And so if you are studying law and international relations and so forth, go in, but go in with this question of always thinking about who is at the, who is at the receiving end of this? What would I want? What would I do? Have empathy and do not assume that you know more than the, than the guy on the ground or the woman on the ground. Always try and that the empathy question should always be um, central to the way you think about it. how would I want to be treated? What would I be doing? Could I cope one night in a refugee camp with a tarp and, and, a, and a log and some, you know, what would I do, right? So, so, so that question of respect and humility and then related to that, what can I do? Where do I sit? What can I do to make a difference? So that, so that it's kind of, it, imagine a kind of an orchestra, all the instruments are really needed. You don't want to, you don't want cacophony. You actually want a little bit of jamming and then sometimes coming together, but, but everybody has something to offer. And, and, um, and we need to build from where we are, not, not, not let the systems get destroyed. So. Wow, what a perfect way to end. And I recognize we've taken an extra 15 minutes of your time. So thank you very much. But that was fascinating. I could sit and talk for hours, but I think that's probably people are probably sick of us now. <laughs> thank but, you very much. No, no, it's our pleasure. Thank you for coming. Um, I think now um, Olivia and I, as tradition, I think with the eight years that this conference has been going on, we tend to have a bit of a wrap up, summarize the key themes. So we'll stay on and, and, and just make those last few comments for anyone that's interested. Um, but Sam, again, thank you so so much for everything. Thank, thank you very much. And I and you know let's let's talk again and see whether there's any way of bringing the um, you know some some conversations between LSE students and you guys and, and yeah yeah. And for anyone that's listening, the LSE podcast, the LSE webinars on YouTube are brilliant and well oh. worth watching. Yes, uh, June, yeah, that's right. June 29th is the next one, um, and it's with Agnes Calamar, who is now the head of Amnesty. Um, uh, May Sabe, who's a Myanmar activist, and Lucy Talgia, who is a Palestinian local council member and a women peace builder. So it's called Act uh, Survival and Activism Under Occupation. Um, so yeah, look it up, join us, and, um, and talk to you soon. Yeah, let me know if you need okay. anything. Okay, Thank bye. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.